Reynolds, let's get into Dunkley and tell you exactly what the message is and what is the spin that lefties will try to put upon it. So, as you know, yesterday, Dunkley by-election, Labor Party, well, they ended up holding on to it, but there was a swing. Was the swing big enough? I'll get to that in a second. But let's not pretend that Labor wasn't worried. People very privately, who, yes, do still talk to me, um, were saying inside Labor they thought this was going to be a problem. Remember, they were starting to spin against the chance of a defeat. And then there was a bit of false hope that was given to those who thought the Libs would do OK with that poll midweek, 51-49. But in the end, it ended up being basically 52 to 40... Sorry, 52.7 to 47.3 round up your numbers or round them down in whatever fashion you like. But obviously, it was a 3.5% swing. Now, that number will change over the next 24, 48 hours as some of the postal votes start to slowly but surely come in. But basically, it's going to be around this 35 maybe a little higher, maybe a little lower. Now, let's go through and show you here the primary vote where the Labor Party, uh, well, 41%, the Liberal 39, Greens at 64 and everyone else on the ballot, 13 0.4% of the overall vote. Now, as, as always, after any election, big or small, change of government or just a by-election, I like to try to go through and tell you the five things that you need to know and what I think happened, most importantly didn't happen, and what may well happen into the future. So let's start here. Number one, the Labor vote, well, it held up, but let's be very clear, if this sort of a swing happened across a general election, they would lose a huge amount of seats. And that's why you can now start to draw a line under about a dozen or so MPs that are going to be nervous about every news poll between now and the next federal election. Now, yes, Labor's vote, in fact, went up compared to where it was in the general election of 2022. So you can't take from this that there was some sort of massive move away from the Labor Party. In fact, they had a higher primary vote than the Liberal Party and it was higher than even at the last election. But, of course, it's not just a system that's based off primaries. Because of our system where you have to give preferences, it's the preferences that started to flow things around and it's the preference flow which becomes the concern. As I said, two-party preferred, 52-47, round up your numbers. Now, if there was a 3.5% swing across a federal election, there would be 10 Labor MPs that would lose their seat. So these are the MPs that are nervous after what has just happened. Now, in Gilmore, in New South Wales, in Lyons, in Tasmania... The Liberal Party is very close, like literally a few hundred votes from being able to take those seats back. Or Labor, if they're able to hold their line, that's what they think they'll be able to hold on to. Lingiari in the Northern Territory, of course, just into Price ran for that at one point in time. It is a tight seat. It did vote no, but it always seems to send Labor MPs back to federal parliament. Now, Ben Along in New South Wales, the former John Howard seat, the former... Uh, John Alexander's seat, the former seat that, of course, Maxine McHugh had for a brief minute, but is now back in Labor hands, and it is there again by only a few hundred votes. The Chinese vote is particularly significant there. In the seat of Higgins, now this is, of course, the place where formerly Peter Costello was the local MP, but the Labor Party ended up winning that seat. Now, not many people believe they'll be able to hold on to that seat at the next election, regardless of what the Liberal Party standing is in Victoria. That may well go teal or green, but still a loss to the Labor Party. Robertson on the central coast of New South Wales matters because if the suburban strategy of Peter Dutton and the Liberal Party is going to work, it has to work on the central coast of New South Wales. In the same way, it has to work on the Gold Coast. It has to work in outer suburban Melbourne. Now, while there was a swing in outer suburban Melbourne, that being Frankston, this, of course, is not enough to change seats. But, again, worth noting. Tangy in Western Australia. Now, this is a seat that is expected to go back to the Liberal Party at the next election because the Labor vote was just that high. Now, always the uh, government loses a bunch of seats between the election that brings them to power and the election that they seek to stay in power. And again, if it's 3.5, Gilmore, Lyons, Lingiari, Benelong, Higgins, Robertson, Tangy, McEwen, Boothby in South Australia, their former MP is a guest on our show tonight. None other than the wonderful, the amazing, the awesome. Please get back in the game. Run for something. Run, Nicole, run. Nicole Flint joins us in a moment. And Patterson. 
which is up around the Hunter Valley. Now, this is something that is always talked about as a potential change, particularly when it comes to renewable energy. But again, Labor always seems to hold on. That said, if there's a 3.5% swing, it happens nationally, 10 MPs disappear. If that's the case, then the Labor Party, of course, ends up with just uh, 67 seats in the parliament. You need 76 to form a majority, which would mean exactly what I have been saying since the last election, which was that the most likely game to be playing for in the 2024 or 2025 election, whenever the Prime Minister decides to call it, is between the Labor Party holding on to a majority, and they've only got two, three seats as a majority, so naturally, just as uh, John Howard, Kevin Rudd, you know, uh, uh, Julia Gillard, the difference between when you win office and when you seek to defend office, you do lose part of your backbench. Where all of that happens? Well, all of those MPs are the ones that are nervous after what took place. Another thing to learn out of what happened in Dunkley last night. Yes, the Liberal Party vote was up, but as I've just explained, it doesn't come from the Labor Party. Now, yes, they were up by almost 7%, 6.5%. It's a good swing, no question about it. Good to see people coming back to the Liberal Party as opposed to going to minor parties, Teal's independence. But let's also be very honest about where this vote potentially has come from. Now, at the 2022 election, One Nation and the United Australia Party had about 7% of the vote. So if the Liberal Party has gone up by about 6.5%, it's fair to say that when the United Australia Party and One Nation are not on the ballot, a lot of those people went back to the Liberal Party. Now, what matters about when the United Australia Party and One Nation are on the ballot is that, unlike the Greens, you can't guarantee that the preferences will flow back to the Liberal Party. If it's like 2022, uh, their preferences can literally split 50-50. If it's like 2019, where, say, two-thirds of the preferences move from United Australia Party, One Nation, Libertarian, a lot of the right-wing parties, well, that can get the Liberal Party over the line as long as their primary vote ends up in a scenario where they've got a primary vote of about 40%. At this election... 39% is where the Liberal Party was, but that's without those two other parties, that if, in a general election, the Liberal Party's vote was at about 39%, preferences from those centre-right parties would probably get it very close to winning a seat. But that's not what happened here. That said, Nathan Conroy is a fantastic local candidate. He's exactly the type of person the Liberal Party needs to pre-select. And also... The Liberal Party, and dare I say, the centre-right, needs to put more effort into local government. There are local government elections coming up in Queensland and New South Wales in the next few months, but would you know who you're voting for? Would you know that your local candidate had a strong position for or against Australia Day? What's their position when it comes to the monuments of the past? Now, to me, the Liberal Party, One Nation and United Australia Party should be putting greater effort into trying to find candidates that, that can run at local council. Local councillors, of course, can one day get the chance maybe to be mayor if the numbers work their way, and then that raises their profile so that when they run in a federal election, people know who the candidate is. There'll be a personal vote for the candidate, as there was for Nathan Conroy, and there's the overall party vote, and those are the magic mix that you need to win a seat and thus enough to win an election. Good news, and everyone can agree on this. Number three, the Greens vote collapsed. Now, I've got to say, I was surprised by this only because people like the Victorian Socialists were running in this seat, the Australian Democrats were running in this seat, so there were plenty of uh, far-left votes out there to get. Well, the Greens vote absolutely tanked. At the last federal election, they got, what, 10.3 per cent of the vote in the seat of Dunkley. A couple of years later, in a by-election, where they were running, was 6.3 per cent. Now, again, there was a little uptick in where the Labor Party vote was, but I'm not entirely sure where this Greens vote went. Now, whether this Greens vote went in part to the, uh, the Liberal Party, I don't think so. The Democrats, well, they didn't get that much of the vote. The Libertarian uh, candidate, who was an excellent part of our uh, pub test, and I hope to be a guest on this program into the future, they did OK, but I'm not entirely sure where this 4% of the vote evaporated to. What is worth noting is that the turnout at this election could be a reason why the Greens vote did not do that well. Just 74% of everyone who was eligible to vote voted in this election. Now, normally, that number is way higher. 
The informal number was about the same as it normally is, so it seems like a reduction in the overall number of people voting, apart from the issues, and the issues are worth noting, but still, if, let's say, young people just said, who cares, send me the fine, maybe that's why the Greens fell down. But the Greens fell hard. Now, I think what the Greens had hoped here was that if these numbers were low and Labor had lost the seat, then the Greens would be able to turn around and say to Labor, see how much you need us? So follow us when we talk about things like, uh, like Israel, when we talk about Palestine. Follow our lead and we can help give you the preferences. Follow our lead about housing and rental rules and we can get you over the line. The problem is the Greens lost 4% of the vote, meaning their capacity to uh, argue anything out of this by-election is put simply gone. Number four, advance Australia is the new bogeyman of the left. Now, you know how many times this... Uh, External third-party group has been mentioned as being some sort of unfair presence. Of course, that's garbage. Now, it is, of course, a centre-right group that was very successful in getting messages out, particularly uh, the social media messages, in and around the voice debate. There's no doubt that you would have seen, maybe even shared and definitely agreed at some of the stuff that had been sent there, particularly when it was built uh, around the senator, Jacinta Nampajimpa Price. This was their opportunity to build on that and to turn into a force to either be feared or to be favoured or something to pay attention to. Instead, they decided to really double down, and I don't quite know why, but they decided to double down particularly on the people who had been released by the High Court and the Federal Government out of permanent detention. Now, the only issue that mattered at this election was cost of living. And I know that there were some elements around, but I think focusing on that stuff was a little unhelpful at best. That said, get ready for some big changes that are going to be happening between now and the next federal election about groups like Advance Australia being able to make the points that they do. There will be limits on how much a third party group can spend in any one seat, meaning that even if they turn around and spend a lot of money, say, at a national level, that still will be pegged and will be divided by seat. Now, they spent apparently the best part of $300,000 and the money in and of itself became quite the conversation. The Guardian talking about how uh, they get an awful lot of donations, but many of them come from unknown people. By the way, that's not because people are being dodgy. It's because it's less than a thousand and a bit dollars that you need before you actually declare anything. But the tactics, well, our mates at Crikey, the far-left media observers and political observers are just general place. Twitter goes to double-check that they're right, says that Advance Australia's tactics heralded a new low in Australian politics. Now, get ready for some changes, as I say, the, to how elections are going to be played. There's going to be some uh, expansion to the Senate. There'll be some caps on how much people can spend, and that probably will go after Advance Australia. And Labor was running as hard against Advance Australia as it was the damn Liberal Party. Obviously, we've got the money that Advance Australia have been pumping into the seat and the effect that's going to have. Advance Australia might have had lots of money, but we have something that they don't have, and that is people power. Yeah. Now also got Advance Australia, their running mate in this election, uh, who are just as negative. Advance Australia have not put out one single policy idea. Uh, interesting, though, of course, that the left that are complaining loud and long and will try to change the rules to go after things like Advance Australia have nothing to say about Get Up, the organisation that for how many elections in a row particularly went after Conservative MPs? Again, Nicole Flint, you know the stories about how she was treated by that organisation. But just in case your memory has faded and you think that Get Up somehow was playing in a different space and was playing less hardball than Advance Australia, remember this ad having a go at Tony Abbott laughing while someone was dying? Help! Help! Tony! Someone's drowning! Ah, uh, look, I think you'll find that the science isn't settled on that. What? Do something! Why should we act first? I think I've given you the response you deserve. <laughs> Despicable. So anyone who wants to tell you Advance Australia is the new low of Australian politics, get up has been there way longer, way lower. Number five. The cost of living fight in terms of elections will be won with the person or the party that has answers, not complaints. 
Now, you know, over and over, we talk about cost of living because it is the number one issue in the country. You know that the Prime Minister offered to the median income earner of Dunkley a $14 a week improvement from July to their wages, yet that is what the electorate has ultimately backed in. Now, Australians know that this is too little too late when it comes to a tax cut. Why? Because they told us last week. This is from Brisbane, though. Have you seen the benefit of those? No, mate, no. It was a look. Nothing. Nothing. I'm not going to get anything. But... And the cost of living is just disgusting. Pretty much a smoke screen because we're still feeling the pinch. Yeah. It might be, but not very much at all because they will get you another way. It's a catch. Now, Peter Dutton has done a very good job along with his team of defining what the problem is of cost of living, but for obvious reasons, there's a moment in time where you have to move from just complaining about something to starting to offer what your solution is. Now, when I was in Dunkley last week, a lot of posters tried to make this the big evil about the Liberal Party that had no plan on cost of living. Now, we know that there are some smart people and there are very smart people who know that this is a big issue. Well, what's the idea? Because you can have Albo's solution of $14 a week in too little, too late tax cuts, or maybe the opposition could say we're going to put back the automatic $1,500 tax return for people. Call for that in the budget in reply speech, demand that it's done on July the 1st of this year. Now, yes, the government won't move, but you will still have a clear difference between what the government is not willing to do and what the opposition will be willing to do. There's also a whole series of things that they should be able to come up with between now and an election that are going to be legitimate advantages to people. Now, that doesn't automatically mean we're turning around and talking about handouts. Tax cuts, of course, are people holding on to their own money. Government doesn't have to borrow more money in order to hand those, to hand those things out. It's not a stimulus check. But there are lots of things, including the cut in petrol excise, alcohol excise, tobacco excise, you name it. There are lots of things that the government can pull the levers on, but they don't. All of those are the types of things that should be promised by Peter Dutton. He can do it coming up this year, and he can do it in his budget in reply speech, because these are all examples of the things the government are not doing, despite the fact that they say they're all in and doing everything they can. Anyway, that's the five things that I wanted to say after what just took place when it comes to Dunkley. Now, about cost of living, a little bit more information that actually underlines my point. It is the number one issue in the country. It was the number one issue, of course, in the Dunkley by-election. And it's also important to note that many of the things that truly are how people experience cost of living are still way above the average inflation rate. Now, the average inflation rate may well be the best it's been in two years, but insurance is almost double that average inflation rate. Bread and cereal, rents, they also are nearly double that overall number. Food products in general are the best part of 7%, as are alcohol and tobacco. Remember, a bottle of Bundy rum, and I get it, you're not hooking into one every night, but that's 63% tax. 49 cents in every dollar of petrol is tax. That's the sort of stuff that I think can move the needle. Non-alcoholic beverages at 6% and dairy-related is at 5%, again, way above average inflation. And this has been noted today by none other than the economics writers over in the uh, Sydney Morning Herald, the Sunday Age, the Sun Herald as well in Sydney, where they noted that our spending habits have changed dramatically and that's why the inflation rate that is currently being presented may not actually be the real inflation rate. For example, our behaviour has changed since COVID, so things like over-the-top uh, inflation right now on bread and cereal, on food products and on dairy is actually an example of where people really are, as opposed to the reductions in other areas which help the overall number that helps the politicians. Let's show the quote. The COVID pandemic has changed Australians' buying habits. We fill our shopping trolleys with more milk and bread. And again, let's see, the milk and bread. Uh, milk is up 5%. Bread is up 7.4%. Food spending as a share of our total expenditure has increased by almost 20% since that pre-COVID period and is back where it was in 2000. As a share of our spending and overall consumption, bread has been falling for decades, but since the pandemic, it has now climbed back to where it was in 2005. So that's the scenario here, right? Where the overall number might be okay, 
but the reality of people spending on things like bread and milk has gone up since the pandemic. So when that inflation rate remains higher than the average, then the real sense of cost of living is still way up here, not the overall number that the government will give itself a high five for every time it walks into the parliament. 